it's nice to see you both. Thank you for joining us. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, we are so glad that you're all here to join us for today's conversation with Harry and Devon and their genre-defying book, Legends of Drag, Queens of the Certain Age. We're so honored to have them and so excited to celebrate their work. I do want to start with a land acknowledgement. Although we are tuning in together from different places, we gratefully acknowledge the native peoples on whose ancestral homelands we gather, as well as the diverse and vibrant native communities who make their home in these places today. We also recognize that since this nation's founding, who is represented and how one is represented reflects the country's flaws as well as its strengths. The National Portrait Gallery strives to present a more complete narrative, one that acknowledges the history of slavery, racism, and inequality in the United States. And we are so pleased to present today's event as part of the Tommy L. Pegas and Donald A. Kapocha conversation series. We welcome our viewers to this series who are zooming in from all over the world. And we ask that you please use the chat function to let us know we are watching. But if you have a question, we ask that you use the Q&A function. That's where we'll be drawing from questions from when we start asking them at the end of the presentation. But at any time, please make sure you put that question and we will make sure if you have a burning desire, we try and answer it. And I especially want to extend a welcome to Tommy, who's here with us today, uh, who served as the National Portrait Gallery's Commissioner since 2015. He and his husband, Don, have been dedicated supporters of the Portrait Gallery since 2008, for which we are so grateful. They are focused on the arts, and their continued friendship enables us to further our mission to explore the history of the United States and biography through identity. And as I mentioned, Tommy is here with us now, so I'd like to invite him to say a few words. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Don and I are honored to sponsor this program, as we especially want to continue to create a safe space to discuss critical issues around LGBTQ plus identity and art. We have enjoyed this series so much and has provided our viewers with robust conversation around our community and promise to do so in the future. We're looking forward to tonight's presentation, Drag Royalty, whose bravery helped move drag culture from the margins of society to mainstream. So thank you all for being here and for your curiosity and for joining us in the belief that portraiture is powerful and it matters. Thank you so much, Tommy. Thank you for your support. Thank you for being here tonight. And thank you for allowing us to welcome our guests, Harry and Devin. Hi, Mindy. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. And let me do the formal introductions here. Harry James Hansen is an artist, creative director, and lifelong drag performer based in Brooklyn. Their work has been published in the New York Times, Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, Rolling Stone, New York Magazine, Vice, Out, MTV News, and Days, among others. As drag artist Ambrosia Alert, she has performed internationally with the Bushwick Festival and appeared on Paper, HuffPost, and Reverie TV. Harry holds a dual BA with honors in photography and film st studies from Wesleyan University. And Devin Antheas is a floral designer, spirit worker, and writer living in San Francisco and New York. They are the founder of the Temple of Dionysus, which hosts regular public rituals in the Bay Area. They teach classes on floral design, ancient Mediterranean mystery traditions, and queer spiritualities. Their writing has been published in Vogue, Harper's, Bazaar, The New Inquiry, and through Contagion Press. Devin provides divination and spiritual counsel to private account clients. So without further ado, let's start with the questions. So we'll begin here with just the beginning, really. Your book is visually stunning, intimate, and insightful. What inspired you to take portraits of drag performers and what makes your portraits so unique? Thank you, Mindy. Um, as you mentioned, my professional background is in photography and I'm a lifelong drag performer as well. Uh, and I'd always desired to find a way for my drag and my visual art to intersect. Uh, and this project is really the ideal manifestation of that. 
Um, and the first kernel of the book sort of emerged when we went to go see a show at a drag show at Aunt Charlie's, which is a famous uh, drag dive bar in San Francisco's Tenderloin neighborhood. Uh, and the median age of the cast was probably about 60, um, which in and of itself was just very remarkable uh, and led to some reflection and conversation between us um, about what we perceived as a, a lack of generational exchange within the drag community or within the overlapping drag communities. Um, and uh, really, it, it was unacceptable to us that this book did not already exist. Uh, so we took it upon ourselves to create it. Yeah, and my background is in floral design. And Harry first kind of brought me into the project uh, to style flowers for the first few portraits. And in my many um, wedding seasons, kind of offering flowers and working on big floral teams for extremely elaborate weddings, um, I kind of came to this understanding that flowers are, you know, even in our very secular age, are considered very crucial for the biggest rituals that we have for weddings, for memorials, for funerals. Um, you know, we give flowers to those that we're courting or um, those that are sick or maybe need, need some healing. And so I think of flowers as being quite magic, but in this kind of role within ritual and within ceremony, they help to kind of establish an otherworldly container. And beyond the kind of um, added creative freedom that doing flowers for drag queens provides as opposed to wedding work. Um, I also, I think that as an element of the portraiture, it helps to kind of like establish the otherworld equality that, that we're entering this other space that's somewhere between the sacred and the profane. And, you know, it helps to really elevate each of these queens and show their unique, uh, their divinity and, and their star power. Um, and so, yeah, it's been a huge honor to, to give the girls their flowers. And I understand that you did this partially before the pandemic, and then as the pandemic hit, you were still creating. So how did the pandemic shape your work? I mean, it definitely, uh, we were midway through the process of securing our book deal and we're figuring out, had been planning a whole tour. And, you know, like many people, the pandemic knocked us on our ass for a little bit, but we quickly recalibrated and realized that because of the threat that the pandemic posed, especially to the elders, that it felt more important and more timely than ever that this be something that, that is done. And thankfully, we had already established a kind of aesthetic within the portraits that, you know, we were shooting outdoors, there was some amount of distance, and we were shooting in full sun. And so it made it pretty easy to adapt to a kind of pandemic safe or, you know, as safe as possible uh, mode of proceeding. And we ultimately decided that, well, if the apocalypse is upon us, this is how we want to spend the last days. So we continued. Nice. Well, one of the things I love so much about your book is not only is it visually stunning, the writing is excellent. And so I love this quote. Uh, while you say your book celebrates queens of a certain age, you write that you found, quote, a lineage of camp in immac immaculate Argo and energy tracing its way back into it, antiquity, where the classicists tell us that men wore masks and fabrics and exaggerated makeup to portray goddesses and heroines and the very origins of the theatrical tradition. So first, that's an amazing sentence. And then also, what can we learn from the history of drag? I mean, I think there's so much we can learn from the history of drag. And you know, there's a lot of people who, especially it's kind of like common uh, folklore within drag communities to talk about Shakespeare as being an origin point for drag, you know? Um, the cast-offs of, of the, the monarchical class uh, by law could not be worn by their servants if they were cast away, but their servants could sell them to the theater. And so you would have these kind of elaborate, heavy gowns showing up on theater stages, and it became a way for the actors through um, certain gestures and through certain forms of adornment to channel a type of, of power, right? And, you know, this is emerging in a context where people still believed in the divine right of Kings, right? So like um, the kings and the queens have this like direct connection to divinity. And so by kind of taking on this ornamentation and these affects and these gestures that invoke that, it's a way for people to kind of channel this power themselves on the stage, right? 
there's an older precedent, you know, if we look at classical theater in ancient Greece, for example, where all of the actors were men, which is to say that like the goddesses and heroines were portrayed by people um, performing a set of gestures and like using um, kind of facial adornment techniques that might, or masking or, or different forms of costumery that in a modern context might look very much like drag, right? And so this starts to give us this understanding that when people are trying to like, channel a tremendous amount of power and also like you know command presence like on stage in ritual in places where people are meeting these like divine or mythic figures uh that's where we start to see what i would say are some of the the origins of the drag tradition right and obviously there's other examples we can look to and you know the there is a wide array of examples and cultures around the world of gender transgressive um, people and performance being understood as sacred. And while that's not really our uh, place to examine in this work, I think it, it's worth adding to the conversation. It's also worth saying that like these uh, gestures and forms of adornment are not solely reserved for the theater, right? Like. Um, a lot of those slave owners that founded uh, this nation were wearing powdered wigs and heels and makeup when they were signing their important pieces of paper. Um, I mean, just look at the way the Pope dresses. Like, there's a, a very clear way in which, like, drag as, like, a series of gestures to, to claim power um, can be seen in a number of contexts. And can you talk a little bit about this, this uh, portrait? Well, this is Hot Chocolate, who is the reigning queen of Las Vegas. Um, she was recently honored in the season finale of the most recent season of RuPaul's Drag Race um, as being a legend and being someone who really uh, did a tremendous amount to open the way for, uh, yeah, people who are practicing the art today. And Hot Chocolate is still, she is still the reigning hostess at Piranha. Um, and she's also the world's foremost Tina Turner impersonator. She's in both of Tina's movies, um, and it also plays a role as an impersonator in uh, Miss Congeniality 2, Armed and Fabulous. Yes, her career spans over five decades, and she hasn't slowed down one bit. Um, we're, uh, we're going to see her again in Las Vegas this fall when we do an event there. Nice. Hot chocolate is one of my favorite names in the books, but there are many to choose from. <laughs> She's uh, incredible. I bet she was a very fun to photograph. Yes, and such a gracious hostess, truly. Yeah, some of our highlights from the Las Vegas trip definitely include uh, cruising around with her in her convertible on the Vegas Strip. And <laughs> she gave us a personal tour of the Bellagio. So yeah, we adore hot chocolate. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. That <laughs> sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, well, I'll move on to the next one, which I think speaks to hot chocolate and quite a number of the queens you photograph in the book. And several of the drag performers you photograph were, and in some cases still are activists. What role has drag played in the fight for queer liberation? Yeah, I mean, I think two of the most famous examples or two of the most commonly talked about icons would be Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson, who were of course instrumental in the organizing that both preceded Stonewall and came after. Um, and you know, it's important, I think, to recognize and respect that although you know the the terms we use to designate our identities have shifted within their lifetimes, they did identify as drag queens. And today they may tell us that they are also trans women, but those identities are not mutually exclusive. Um, and I think in, in part, the reason that they played such a visible role is that it's impossible to hide as a drag queen. You, you are sort of by default on the front lines. You can't be discreet or fly under the radar if you, know, you have a two foot tall wig on your head and you're covered in bugle beads. Um, so you know, they have sort of been de facto leaders within the community and by extension within you know, these revolutionary movements. Uh, this photo here is of Sir Lady Java um, in Los Angeles, who was instrumental in the beginnings of this LGBT civil rights movement in Los Angeles. Um, she actually partnered with the ACLU in the late 60s after one of her shows was shut down. Um, and she sued the state of California to repeal um, 
the anti-cross-dressing laws that were on the books at the time. And although her initial attempts were unsuccessful, she really got the ball rolling there in terms of the, um, the legislation that was discriminating against drag performers and trans women. Um, and so it was an incredible honor to shoot with her. Uh, she's now 80. As she told us, I'm 80 child, that's not to be played with. Um, and here we see her seated in a, a throne, which is regularly uh, in her living room. Um, this was how she received us when we visited her at home. Um, and we, we brought it outside into her front yard for this portrait. Um, but yeah, Java definitely stands out to me as, you know, um, one of the early, not only was she an early activist, but she was also an early uh, drag icon within the mainstream. Um, she toured uh, North America, Mexico, Canada, the United States. Um, she was featured in Jet magazine. Uh, and so we tend to think of drag performers in the mainstream as a modern phenomenon when, in fact, Java's been doing it since the 60s. Um, so, yeah, it's it's been such a privilege to, to highlight um, those performers who have done such important work and are still with us. Yeah, and I, for me, uh, when I think of uh, queens in the book who played instrumental roles or, like, are tapped into a very immersive history. I think of Joan Jett Black, who lives in San Francisco, and who we recently, in addition to uh, photographing, we had the pleasure of working with for our San Francisco release events. Um, and Joan is just incredible. As a teenager in Ohio, she, uh, in, as a teenager in the Midwest, she, like, ran away from home, joined the Gay Liberation Front, was later active in Queer Nation, in ACT UP, in the Radical Fairies. Um, and in terms of queens in the book, I can't think of one who has like spans a kind of like historical memory of, of more organizations. She also ran for president famously in 1992. The first drag queen to run for president yes, that we know of. That we know of. Under the, under the slogan, a vote for Joan Jet Black is a vote for total anarchy. Um, and this was part of Queer Nation's efforts to draw attention to um, the AIDS crisis at a moment when uh, the ruling class was still in, in very active denial about it. And yeah, you know, she was like, if a, if a bad actor can run for president, why can't a good drag queen? And she's just absolutely incredible and has been part of so many organizations. And also has like a real understanding of some of the through lines between those organizations, that being uh, love, pleasure, camaraderie. And I, I am really excited to be sharing her story with the readers as well. Yeah, that's a very powerful photograph. And can you speak a little bit to the floral design you've done here? Oh, for Java's portrait? Yes. Yeah, so these are actually uh, the hedges in her front yard. And, you know, we knew Java was a kind of surprise addition. Uh, we, she's very reclusive. We weren't sure we would be able to make contact with her. Um, and we tried for months. And then in an act of pure serendipity, she reached out to us when we were in LA for our final round of shoots. And we talked about it and knew we had to make space for her in the book and decided that if we were going to go for it, we were going to go all out. And so we found the most gorgeous blooms we could at the LA flower market and spent the afternoon uh, ornamenting her her front hedges to kind of create her this yeah this portal that's surrounding her seated in her throne she's a Leo also and I think that that really comes through in the, the vibrancy in the summer now there were some um, drag performers who chose not to uh, be activists and you, you do speak to that quite a bit in the book as well. Is there anyone that sticks out to you in that sense? Well, Java would tell you that she didn't choose this life, that it chose her. Um, and she also speaks to some of the sacrifices that she had to make because of her prominence. And she didn't try to be an activist and she didn't start that way. She was just the most beautiful man in the world as the papers called her or the most beautiful female impersonator in the world. And that prominence meant that she kind of became a lightning rod uh, in order to like overturn these kind of like repressive laws that were outlawing cross-dressing. Um, but yeah, and she also speaks pretty frankly about how much she had to sacrifice and that she feels like she was never able to, for example, pursue love in her lifetime or any meaningful relationships because she felt that she needed to sacrifice that part of herself so that she could be such a prominent 
uh, public figure. And so there definitely is a trade-off that comes with the visibility and notoriety of, of certain forms of action. And in Java's estimation, she did it for the girls so that they wouldn't have to. And for those who aren't aware, can you just quickly describe ACT UP and some of the organizations you described earlier? Yeah, ACT UP is the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power uh, that carried out a number of direct actions during um, the kind of like heyday of, of the AIDS crisis. There's, they're around still as an organization in, in various forms and various locations um, in New York City. They just uh, staged a demonstration demanding uh, kind of better uh, response to this kind of new monkeypox situation. So ACT UP is very much still active. Uh, Queer Nation was uh, also active in the same era and took on a, a more militant approach. Um, the Gay Liberation Front was one of the first organizations that emerged after the Stonewall riots. Um, they started the Christopher Street Parade that became the, what we now know as Pride. Thank you for that. And yeah. ex excellent. I love talking about history as a historian, so I really appreciate that. And I just want to make sure everyone uh, Thank you knows for what we're talking about. <laughs> So on to the next question. And before we do that, I just want to remind anyone who's tuning in, please make sure you ask questions for our guests so that when we uh, get to the Q&A, we have some amazing things to ask them. I know there must be lots of things on your mind. So at any point, please make sure you put your questions in the Q&A. So in your introduction, you described two generations of modern drag performers. Those who are inspired by divine and those who are inspired by mainstream drag. Can you introduce, introduce us to Divine and help us understand the differences between these generations? Sure. Uh, Divine is an actress, muse, recording artist, troublemaker, uh, most famous for her appearances in John Waters films, notably Pink Flamingos, Female Trouble, Desperate Living. And she's not, oh, in, desperate she's not in Desperate Living. Uh, Pink Flamingos, Female Trouble, and Hairspray. Um, she was on the cusp of more mainstream stardom. Uh, she was preparing for a role on Married with Children um, when she passed in 1988. Uh, and, you know, to quote Pink Flamingos, um, there are two types of people in this world, my type of people and assholes. Um, and so I think that, you know, separates the two schools of thought pretty clearly. Um, I would say that you know, in contrasting divine style to more mainstream drag, I think a lot of it has to do with who the audience is. Um, Divine's audience was very queer versus nowadays drag on TV is for more mainstream America. So I think it's it, it has to do with the intention of the performer in terms of who they're performing for um, would really separate those two schools. And in Divine's case specifically, um, you know, I think what made her so unique and such a, a visionary is that really her filthiness and her divinity or her glamour were not mutually exclusive. Um, you know, her filthiness made her more glamorous. Um, and so, you know, that's a, an ethos that we really embrace. Totally. And I think it's worth noting that um, this bifurcation or this delineation between divine's people and assholes isn't necessarily a generational thing. You know, there's certainly people our age and younger who uh, drew a lot of inspiration from divine. Um, and we also had, you know, in it, we had a lot of opportunities in the book to kind of ask people who their influences were. And she, more than any other person, was listed over and over and over again as someone who really inspired a lot of people. And when I think of which queens in the book really um, encapsulate and continue that legacy, uh, I think, first of all, about Fatima Rood, who passed away a few years ago, but was just an amazing creature and, um, you know, really pushed the kind of freaky avant-garde San Francisco style of drag even further. And she spoke a lot about how um, she would see in the kind of drag looks of newly arrived kids in San Francisco, um, the same uh, aesthetics or perhaps even the same look, perhaps to an uncanny degree as queens who had passed away in, in generations before them. And that like unbeknownst to these newcomers, they were channeling um, the ancestors. And I think that divine is certainly uh, has a look 
and has an ethics and has a kind of force of performance that we see um, repeating over and over again. Um, the other queen that comes to mind uh, as a, really in that kind of lineage would be Jojo Baby, who is featured uh, on the screen currently. And Jojo Baby actually got her start in drag at the age of 14 as a divine impersonator in the Chicago clubs. And she's a renowned club kid. She lent her personal wardrobe to dress the extras in Party Monster, the movie. Um, she, yeah truly incredible, truly a otherworldly being, um, and very, very much uh, divine in in the sense that we're talking about. And Harry, I know you're a performer. What yes. step would you put yourself in? Oh, I'm definitely uh, uh, within the divine lineage as well. Um, you know, I, I can't sing and I can't dance and I'm not that pretty. So I, I have to rely on um, shock value. Um, so I definitely lean into that. Um, and uh, yeah, Amber, uh, Amber or Ambrosia, uh, my drag persona um, is definitely very much so filthy gorgeous. She's a stunt queen for sure. Love to catch you, when's your next show? You know, I actually have one coming up at uh, La Mama in New York City um, in August, on August 26th. Um, and uh, a couple more gigs in the fall. Uh, though I'm, I'm very fortunate, I've never um, been in a position where I need to make my living from doing drag. So it's more purely for creative expression and my own entertainment. Um, it's or, community service. Really. It's, it's community service, yes. Excellent. <laughs> Well, accompanying your portraits are poignant biographies of performers arranged by region. And I really like that when you get the book, you can open it up. You don't have to read the whole book in the whole sitting. You can go by cities. I, for example, read a lot of the people in the South. I really were drawn to them. So we, can you speak to the two or three or four individuals who really change your perspective and challenge your expectations over the course of this project? Sure. Um, the first that comes to mind for me would be the goddess Bunny, who's depicted on screen now. Um, she really, in my mind, more than any other queen, really defined her own matrix of success outside of mainstream or societal expectations of what is beautiful and who can be successful. Um, you know, she did use a wheelchair. She had polio as a child, so she was disabled her entire life. Um, and that never slowed her down. It never stopped her. Um, she was a fixture in the underground club scene in Los Angeles for decades. She appeared in uh, Marilyn Manson's music videos. Um, and, uh, and and <laughs> was so um, was so immediately candid with us. I mean, she loved attention. So um, <laughs> she was was very, uh, candid with us about her um, rather incredible biography, um, including, you know, that she was born atop the Santa Monica Ferris wheel and descends from the Italian royal bloodline and worked as Ronald Reagan's personal secretary and dated Ricky Martin when he was 19. Um, and I can't verify any of those facts for you, um, but she told them to us as truths, as part of her personal history, and we accept and respect that. Um, she was speaking from a, a much more uh, glamorous timeline than the one that we're currently stuck in. Yeah, um, but I think, you know, for the goddess Bunny in particular, drag was really essential to her survival. Um, and And that was so so beautiful and inspiring to see. And in terms of queens that challenged my expectations, um, and perhaps this is just because we're in Florida right now, but uh, Charity Charles comes to mind. Um, Charity Charles was Miss Fire Island 1968. Um, we shot with her in, uh, in the back of her dear friend China's uh, trailer in Fort Lauderdale. And she's just a knockout. She's still an absolute beauty queen. And as part of our process, we conducted interviews with each of the queens. And we, we have a standard set of questions that we start with and then um, have some kind of more pointed ones. But one of the things we asked them all is how they got into drag. And for the most part, uh, the queen's responses can kind of fit into a couple of categories, right? A lot of them 
did, started doing drag as a dare. Um, a lot of them did it for the first time on Halloween, you know, when the veil is thin and the spirits uh, are more present. Um, some of them did it for talent contests. And Charity's absolutely blew my mind. She told us that when she was 18 in Boston in the 60s, um, she was basically courted by an older gentleman who dressed her in drag, um, bought her all sorts of like really nice designer clothes, and eventually introduced her to this secret society that was functioning on Beacon Hill in Boston of these other like elder, uh, wealthy, powerful men who all had younger drag queen lovers and would throw these parties where um, at first glance, it would seem to be gender segregated in a way that you might expect in the 60s, right? The, after dinner, the men would retire to the library to smoke cigars and the girls would gather around and gossip and kiki. Um, but in fact, it was all of these uh, kind of drag couples, basically. And she talks about how when she got good enough at um, passing, that they would, in fact, go out and have dinner parties at restaurants. And it wouldn't just be these kind of, like, affairs in private homes. And just to know that that type of world existed in Boston in the 60s, um, both kind of broke the mold of how people get into drag, but also completely defied um, our understanding of, of the history of this stuff and just how far back it goes. Do you have any funny stories you'd like to share? I'm, I'm loving your insights. Oh, God, mm. funny. So many. I mean, the funniest thing to me will always still be uh, Kelly Ray in North Carolina um, after our shoot, hanging out with us poolside and talking to us about, uh, you know, how pornography these days lacks um, the the kind of like fantasy quality and she's really you know disparaging of the only fans era and she was talking about wanting to like you know revive the kind of uh the fantasy uh within pornography and I just I always chuckle when I think about that conversation <laughs> yes and uh I think one of the best one-liners would be from uh Dina Jacobs one of our models uh from Houston Texas we, we asked all the queens their astrological signs and included those in the book. Um, and when we asked Dina her sign, she said, fish, baby, what else? Um, she's a Pisces. Um, <laughs> and uh, that just, the timing was so perfect. <laughs> Excellent. I, I just love this photograph, by the way. I think it's so mm -hmm. empowering. And I don't know what these flowers are, but they're gorgeous. This they're, is such a Go there's ahead. hydrangeas in there. Um, there's some asparagus fern that's been painted gold, um, you know, as befits a queen. And then I see, there's some roses. The rose variety is called quicksand. Um, and then there's some cool like heirloom carnation varietals in there as well. It's gorgeous. And this is around her, her home, I assume. Yeah, yeah this actually, um, this came together very last minute. We had another location in her neighborhood identified and it it's, we sort of got rained out in the morning and then we were running around her neighborhood trying to find another spot. And um, I just happened to notice this um, white iron fence, which was very sort of uh, typical of her Inglewood neighborhood. Um, and we always wanted to sort of communicate a sense of place through our settings. So it seemed fitting and it also, um, I thought went well with her tiara. Um, and so we we scurried over to this uh, this fence, and the sun was shining through at just the right angle. And I would say Devin created that floral installation on her wheelchair in maybe like ten minutes. It was yeah. it was pretty quick. Um, this, this was a very magical shot for sure. Thank you. I love it. And I just have one more question for you both. Uh, so again, if you have questions to ask them, now's your chance. Please put that in the Q and A. Um, while drag has started to work its way into mainstream society, historically, drag performers have struggled to find their place, even within the queer community. What can we learn from drag and how does it help us better understand gender norms and ourselves? Um, we can learn so much from drag. And I think that as, as many answers as drag gives us, it also presents us with new questions and encourage us to be, encourages us to be comfortable with ambiguity. Um, but I think what it, what it underscores for me is that, you know, so few people really do conform to the rigid gender binary. 
Um, and while society may view that as a deficit or a defect, it is in fact an asset. Um, and it's an avenue for unlimited self-expression. Um, and I think you really see that throughout our book um, that there isn't any one way to do drag. So many of these performers have different perspectives and they're all equally valid and interesting and incredible. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, speaking about uh, this kind of the struggle sometimes happening even within queer communities, uh, the queen that comes to mind for most for me is Pansy, uh, who we went to Fire Island to shoot with. And Pansy is the founder of an event called the Fire Island Invasion, where every 4th of July, she packs a boat full of drag queens and goes from Cherry Grove to the Fire Island Pines and stages an invasion. And this, you know, while it's now become this very celebratory um, act of theater, uh, it also started as a protest um, because in 1976, um, a drag queen from Cherry Grove was expelled from a family friendly uh, establishment in the Pines. And this led to um, a lot of anger in Cherry Grove. Uh, and there was already some tension between those communities then. And, you know, according to Pansy, people got a little more drunk through the course of the evening. And I want to quote her directly so I don't mess this up. But she said, we decided to have our own flotilla to the Pines and tell them to go fuck themselves. And so they did. And it was such a success. And they were met with such revelry. And, you know, they blessed the waters and uh, blessed the revelers. And so it's continued every year since then. And uh, they're aiming to, to at least make it to the 50th anniversary of that. But I think that it shows that sometimes, you know, we think of um, actions like Stonewall or Compton's Cafeteria, where the conflict is with the police or with the state. But sometimes the conflict is um, with gay business owners. Uh, within the community too and you know there's there's a way in which uh queer communities are not homogenous and yeah the some of the girls have had to fight for their space from the very beginning nice and this is another fantastic photograph uh, to me it seems like a peacock we were discussing this in our our pre-meetings but for you it's a it's a throw <laughs> yeah, this is Rumi Misabu, who uh, was an original member of the Coquettes in San Francisco. Uh, for people who are unfamiliar with them, the Coquettes really are the blueprint for the kind of uh, avant-garde drag that you, you can expect in the Bay Area. And Rumi, uh, speaking to this question of identity and norms, she doesn't use the label drag queen anymore, but rather uh, identifies as an identity curator. Um, and so I think that it shows that even within people who established or uh, really like set the template within the traditions, a lot of them move to different places to kind of understand what it is they're doing and what they're offering. And for her, she sees herself as a curator who's, you know, picking different pieces of identity and, and piecing something new together every time as a, a new or unique work of art. Well, thank you. I want to make sure we have plenty of time for our uh guest to ask questions. We have a few. If you don't mind, I'll turn to them. I want to start with this question. What do you think of the real app impact of the Harlem Hamilton's lodged drag balls? It may be one of the earliest expressions of drag. I'm sorry, could you repeat the first part of that? Sure. It's a question about Harlem's Hamilton lodge drag balls. So the early drag balls that predated Pose and one of the earliest expressions of drag. Yeah, um, I mean, even going back even further, uh, there was a queen named William Dorsey Swan who was holding drag balls in DC in the 1890s. Um, and so I think, you know, and certainly there, have, there are balls that even predate that history. Um, so there's, uh, there is, so much richness within ball culture. We did um, speak with a few queens in New York who come out of that world. Um, and it's really exciting to see the way that it's been uplifted um, you know, on television recently, um, but also at the same time, and, and this in fact was a criticism of Paris's burning at the time that it came out, was that although it had generated all of this acclaim for you know, the art form in the abstract, oftentimes that support didn't extend to the actual performers who were part of the scene. Um, and so I think, you know, it, it's a, a reminder to be 
conscious and aware of you know where these references are coming from um and you know to be aware of that history uh yeah certainly you know i've i've never been to a, a drag ball in harlem because i've never been invited but i would love to go um yeah and i i think that one of the unfortunate consequences of kind of the drag race uh, impact on the drag industrial complex is that you get this homogenization or this flattening where we understand all of these different things as being this one art form drag. And one of the, the things that we've attempted to tease apart in the course of the book is that there are what we call drag is in fact a variety of different traditions with distinct lineages um, within which there were of course a uh, crossover and uh, exchange. Right. Indeed, drag is not the genre, but it is the medium. Thanks. Well, we've got lots of questions, so we'll move on to the next one. Can you talk about anyone who declined to participate in your project and perhaps why? Hmm. Um, yeah, you know, there, uh, there, there was a performer in San Francisco who declined to participate. I, I, I didn't have an extended conversation with her myself. But my impression was that um, she was wary of being identified as a drag queen or doing drag because she's a trans woman. Um, and, you know, I, I think understandably there are some trans women who feel like that association with drag sort of undercuts the validity of their femininity. Um, and of course, you know, we're very much trying to present uh, the opposite that, um, you know, as I said earlier, those identities are not mutually exclusive. And in fact, many of the, the gestures that Devin was referring to um, that we come to understand as drag stem from survival tactics that uh, were developed and cultivated and refined by trans women. Um, so, and unfortunately, I think RuPaul's Drag Race has in some ways sort of exacerbated the schism between those communities um, because of their treatment of drag performers. I'm glad, excuse me, because of their treatment of trans performers. Um, I, I'm glad to see that that stance is softening a little bit. Um, but, you know, certainly we wanted to um, present the other side of that coin. Uh, so maybe once she sees this book, she can uh, soften to the idea and she'll be in volume two. Some of the girls were very hesitant to get in drag in the daylight and uh, do a shoot out in the public. And some took a bit of convincing, but ultimately uh, we're glad that we were able to make it work with most of them. Beyond that, I feel like a lot of the, the queens we missed this time around were it was mostly scheduling issues, yeah. but there will be future books. <laughs> That's excellent. That's one of the other questions. Uh, thank you for including Barbara Herr in your book. There are many legendary drag performers of a certain age in Puerto Rico. Do you think you'll be expanding your project? Absolutely. Um, I would love to photograph the entertainers in San Juan. Um, and it was actually, it was on our list for the first book and we just didn't, it, it didn't jive with our schedule. Um, but I, I have, I've been to San Juan. I've seen the talent there. I know it's incredible. Um, and I know Barbara would be a very good informant for us um, when it comes to identifying that talent. Um, absolutely, we would we would love to shoot the the stars of San Juan. Yeah, there's there's queens all over the world that um, we would love to to create portraits of. Yeah, and you do have uh, plans for a second or a third project or book. Yeah, we ha we have a running list of queens that we maybe didn't get to or weren't able to schedule with uh, for this book in in time for our deadline. Um, who we would love to get to again. Uh, we definitely think an international edition uh, could be in the works. Yes. There's a queen named Gilda Love in Barcelona who's 97. Um, and so she's she's top priority. <laughs> well, and just a plug for a future event, we are going to do a fantastic program on Silvia Rivera. Oh, fantastic. Uh, which I know you wrote about as well. Uh, if you'd wanted to share a little bit about her history. 
Well, yeah, I mean, Harry already spoke uh, some to, to her importance. She was a participant in the uprising surrounding Stonewall. Uh, she was a founder, along with Marsha P. Johnson, of STAR, the street transvestite action revolutionaries who um, established a house where young queens could uh, seek refuge. Um, she had a very contentious relationship with some of the kind of gay liberation and lesbian feminist currents at the time. Um, to quote her, hell hath no fury like a drag queen scorned. Yes, and she was very, she was definitely one of the, um, uh, she was very outspoken about being um, opposed to the corporate commodification of pride. Um, so uh, definitely grateful to her for that. Right, and we're very excited. We have a fantastic photograph of her in the National Portrait Gallery. I believe it's soon going to go on display. We're oh, so fantastic. excited to have that. And um, you can also find her in one of our Google Arts and Culture exhibits. There was recently a TikTok. It's we're definitely trying to, to tell her story and celebrate her in the way she deserves. And we're excited for the program we're going to do um, in a few weeks. So stay tuned to that. Check your portal emails for that information. Yeah, we're um, very excited to hear the queens are going to be in the gallery. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Do you know Lady Chablis from Savannah, Georgia? Beyond playing a role in John Burnett's Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil and being a real celebrity, both local, locally and nationwide and internationally, I admire her as a cutting edge and courageous to perform so unbashedly and fun-lovingly in assertive Savannah in the 1980s and 90s. Would you say that Lady Chablis played a pivotal role in the drag queen communities? Absolutely. Um, that's such a, a touching description of her. Um, yes, unfortunately, Lady Chablis passed before we began this project, um, but I was actually reading her autobiography as we were working on the book, um, and I came across a name, Tina DeVore, who was identified as being Chablis' drag mother. And so immediately I get online and I'm like, do, 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 Tina DeVore, is she still around? Um, and she she was at the time, and we photographed her in Atlanta. Um, and she spoke about her history with Lady Chablis. So in a way, Chablis is in the book, or her story is through Tina. Um, and uh, uh, since photographing her, Tina passed last year. Um, so we were very fortunate to have the opportunity to work with her. She was one that was a little nervous to, to get out in Dragon Sunlight, but we're so blessed and grateful that she did and that we had that moment with her. Well, I do encourage you, if you have any more questions, to put them in the Q&A. Uh, in the meantime, I know you've been doing these programs all across the nation. Is there is there any question that was really fantastic that we've missed? Dear. Hmm. Honestly, the questions that y'all put forward uh, were some of the most insightful <laughs> questions we've received and definitely broke the the boilerplate that we've come to expect from interviews. <laughs> so we're we're very happy with your questions. And you know, maybe we should forward these to some other sources. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that. I'll definitely accept the compliment. Thank you. Well, we're so honored to have you here. Um, do you have any if you could speak to the thing that inspired you most from doing this, is there anything that really stands out, thing that you personally learned, either in terms of your floral designs or your practice as a drag queen, anything that you learned from this that your real takeaway? Yeah, I think um, for me, it's really the, uh, the magical potential that's unleashed when you're willing to surrender your ego and um, really trust in collaboration. Um, and I think a great example of that would be our, our cover model, Mother Chucka. Um, I mean, you know, this photo is so fabulous, but you know, her eyes are crossed, her bra strap is hanging out. You can, you can see the saliva in her mouth, um, but it's still undeniably glamorous. Um, and, you know, she, <laughs> yay, we got books on deck. Um, but the fact that she was, you know, willing to surrender her ego in that way and, and trust that we would document her in the best light um, was, 
I mean, the proof is in the pudding. Um, it was very rewarding, certainly. Definitely. And in terms of, uh, for me, inspiration, I definitely think of uh, Lawanda, who is one of our Vegas queens, who, you know, we at first, uh, we wanted to get in touch with her. We were having some trouble doing so. Everyone told us that we needed to see her when we went to Vegas. And she actually showed up as an assistant for Duana Moore, who is another one of the queens. I'm just helping to kind of touch up her makeup through the course of the shoot. And it meant that we were able to shoot with her. We were like, hey, we, we have an extra day. Can we work with you? And her story really, really, really is truly inspiring. Um, she suffered a stroke, uh, after which she was told that she would never walk or talk again. And she's walking, she's talking, she's performing, she's more fabulous than ever. She stays on the cutting edge in terms of fashion and style. And just her story is really, really, really inspiring. Um, in terms of my personal practice as a floral designer, I think the thing that maybe pushed me the most was um, our shoot with Poison Waters in Portland. This floral arrangement is built into this weird abandoned structure called the Witch's House in a forest in Portland and literally is held together by one piece of chicken wire and one piece of fishing line. Um, and so in terms of mechanics for floral installations, um, it was quite a challenge, but I found the perfect screw in that, <laughs> um, in that Witch's House and was able to piece it all together from there. I think we have another question. How do you decide what flowers to pair with what people? Well, we definitely ask the girls if they have any favorite flowers. Um, we also ask them what they're intending to wear and we tend to have an environment in mind. And so the flower selection is partly like a triangulation, right? Between the flowers and their fits and the environment. And so we definitely, I think, use the flowers as much as possible to piece those things together. Um, if they have a favorite flower or a specific request, we try to meet that. But to be honest, a lot of it is just what looks best at the flower market or at the flower farm in that city at that time of year. Mm -hmm. Occasionally we did some foraging as well, um, which gives you like a little regional flair. Yeah, all of that fennel in um, uh, Rumi's portrait that I think is what make, gives it that peacock quality that you were picking up on. Um, we foraged that morning, so. Very nice. And can you speak to your next project? Are we allowed to say what you're busy doing? Well, we're very busy on tour right now. Um, we've done tour events in a number of cities. We're in Florida now um, because we have three events in South Florida this week in Miami and Fort Lauderdale. Uh, we'll be touring uh, at a number of locations throughout the fall, including Atlanta, Las Vegas, LA. We're hoping to get to New Orleans, um, Portland. So we'll be touring through the rest of the year. Uh, beyond that, we... Like we said, we we have we feel like we have some more books in us. We've been toying with a television treatment for uh, some of this work. Uh, yeah, we've been talking about a drag church, a drag museum. You know, the sky's the limit. Who can say? Um, when you know, it's like now we have this incredible network of performers across the country, um, and so part of that conversation has been like, well. How do we get them more gigs? How do we get them booked? How do we help them find more financial or economic stability? How could we help get them healthcare? Um, and so I think, uh, you know, we've been able to, to book them for all of these tour events we've been doing, which has been a, a nice little bonus for them. And hopefully getting them on television would lead to some increased exposure and opportunities beyond that. We think putting a bunch of queens who are struggling with housing insecurity into a big mansion and rolling camera would be a great television show. Yes. I do not disagree. <laughs> not one, not yeah. one bit. And I really appreciate the work you've done for mm -hmm. these drag communities and drag performers. And I admire your work and your book is just so fantastic. I encourage anyone to pick it up. You've challenged photography, you've used, um, flowers in an interesting way. It's just very impressive. So thank you for joining us. I'm thank so excited you. that we had very, that very kind work. Thank you. It's <laughs> been such a pleasure. Um, I do want to say a little bit about the next events we have coming up. So these are all going to be on Zoom. You can sign up for the portal newsletter to find out about these. We share them on our Instagram page, the National Portrait Galleries page. And um, 
any number of places, but these are all virtual. So the next in our event in our Pegasus Capocha conversation series on LGBTQ portraiture is Art Afterwards. That's a book discussion with Reva Lehrer, who is one of the artists currently featured in the Outwind Gallery. Um, she has a portrait of um, Achi Abeas, and it's part of her Risk series. If you haven't been to the Outwind and you're around here, please make sure you attend that. It's going to be it's a, it's a fantastic show. And this conversation will be great. It's with Reva and Carmen Maria Machado, who's got an amazing book uh, about death and domestic violence within the LGBTQ community. That's Tuesday, August 9th at 5.30. That's also in partnership with the Martin Luther King Jr. Library. And then on Tuesday, August 16th at 5 p.m., Kate Clark LeMay will moderate Sochi Sakamoto and the Three Year Swim Club, a conversation with Julie Checkaway and Kelly Nakamura. This event is part of the Greenberg Steinhauser Forum and American Portraiture. And we'll, it's such a fantastic, inspiring story. If you don't know about that, you'll be glad you tune in and learned because it's an inspiration. And then finally, we ask that you join us on August 30th at 5 p.m. for Queering Women's Suffrage in the United States with historians Anya Jabour and Wendy Rouse and moderator Kate Clark May. And this is another part of our ongoing Pegasus Capocha conversation series programs. And that will be also fascinating. And we hope you tune in. And we thank all of you for joining us. I hope you have a great evening. And I just want to say thank you.